Today we have a, a panel of distinguished guests. Uh, and, and I'm really excited uh, to have you all here. Uh, and then we have Rebecca, who you know from several sessions ago. She'll be hosting. Uh, and then I'm actually going to let you all introduce yourselves or, or go through that. Uh, so actually, I'm going to start with you real quick. Hello. There we go. Hey, everyone. My name is Emily Shea. I lead the application integration go-to-market team for AWS. Um, so all the great services that we've been talking about today, Step Functions, EventBridge, SQS, SNS, um, and all of that group of services for AWS. Excellent. Jamie. Uh, my name is Jamie Duell. I lead the EventBridge uh, team. I'm uh, based out of Vancouver, Canada, so jet lag is really kicking in right about now, but we'll try to be coherent. <laughs> it's always good to have a caveat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was low Hi folks, I'm Osman. I'm the general manager for events and workflow so at AWS. So this includes EventBridge, Step Functions, Managed Workflow, so Apache Airflow, and a bunch of other internal services. I'm also similarly jet lagged, <laughs> but uh, no excuses. You can't, no excuses. No I do excuses. like that. And you also can't use the same one. So yeah. you have to come up with something. Yeah, so really should have said on this side. So <laughs> Dan. Hi, my name's uh, Dan Ronald. I'm a principal product manager for the uh, Step Functions team. So I'm also based out of uh, Vancouver. Uh, my main focus has actually been uh, developer experience. So I've been with AWS for about three years. Um, I was jet lagged until I passed out for an hour in the lounge about a few hours ago. So. <laughs> right, nice. And then Joe, actually, Joe's coming from, from Mongo. So we have some, obviously one of our big partners, have some great feedback from them. So Joe? Yeah, I'm the odd one out. I do apologize for that. I work for MongoDB. Um, I am director of developer advocacy. I run a global team of advocates. John, who works with me, did a talk just before this session. Um, we've done a lot of integration with AWS, with EventBridge, with SQS, with a bunch of others, with IAM. Um, Obviously, AWS is one of our most important cloud partners, and we're really happy to have participated in this event. All right, excellent. All right, and then, of course, Rebecca. What, Kula Jan? Yeah. Yes, with the DZ. Yeah. I got it, okay. Uh, she's going to be hosting, and why don't you tell them what you do at AWS? Yeah, so uh, I'm Rebecca or Beck. I'm a solutions architect in the public sector team. Uh, I work very closely with all of these folk, um, getting feedback from the field, which is you guys, our customers, uh, to the product teams. Uh, and I love, if you went to my talk earlier, you'll know that I love Step Functions, EventBridge, and the whole app integration suite. Um, but really, I'm here in my official capacity as AWS Oprah to grill these guys <laughs> and then hand over to you guys uh, in the crowd to get some of your questions. Trademark infringement. <laughs> so, all right, thank you very much. Now, here's how this is going to work. So Rebecca's going to be talking to them and adding, asking some questions. But also, if you have some questions you would like to ask, use the app. If you'll bring those in, and I'll give them to Bex uh, as they're coming in. So, I mean, obviously, you have a, a team of, of pretty high, high uppers here. Uh, so I'm not sure if that's a right term, but there it is. Uh, so ask the questions you have, and we'll forward them on. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay, awesome. So I'm going to start off with a general question. Um, so what's your favorite AWS service? And if you work for a product team, it can't be your own one. And Usman, good luck picking your favorite. <laughs> I don't know if I'm going to answer that question. I'm going to take the fifth, which is something in America they do when they don't want to answer a question. I can't pick, come on. They're both my services. Yeah, you can't pick because otherwise... I, th I'll, I think I'm going to pick auto-scaling, my former service. Okay, there you go. Done. <laughs> and why? I, I <laughs> okay. I, 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 maybe I think the better answer for me would be like, why did I leave auto scaling to come work on these services? I, I think I so I ran auto the auto scaling services for five years at AWS before I joined this group and we launched EventBridge and then later on Step Functions joined. Um, I think that focus um, from IT operations and infrastructure to really accelerating developers. I'm having been, been a developer myself for over a decade. Um, Helping developers write the code that matters. I think that's my has been my passion since I've joined this group in 2018. And if anything, it has been strengthened by the, the people and the discussions I've had today. Um, so I know I didn't quite answer your question, what's my favorite service? But I can tell you why these services are my favorite service. Because, because of that focus and the, the effect it can have on the world at large, uh, helping developers all over the world uh, do more with, with their time. That's a great answer. Emily, how are you going to follow? I'm going to go with a classic and pick S3. 
Because I think it is just such a fundamental, like so simple, so effective, massively powerful, probably the first service I touched at AWS. So uh, I'm going to have to go with Emily on this one. But my, my role uh, at AWS right now kind of falls right in the category of overhead. But I did start as a developer at one point in time, and I still like to write code, even though the team doesn't let me check anything in anymore. Um, but I, I love, uh, you know, the, the perfect technology as a developer tool for me is, is, is uh, you know, the intersection of something that is very powerful and very flexible, but presents itself very intuitively and elegantly. And I think S3 really does that as well. Simple file storage. I could turn it into a website. I could turn it into events. I can do a lot of different things with it. Dan? Sure. I, I, I'm going to go with Lambda. So, just, Thank, just Thankfully, someone said it. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's been a game changer for event driven applications. I mean, the ability with the Firecracker technology and the ability to spin up, spin up a function, um, so many of them in parallel and uh, so quickly, is game changing. Uh, so, despite the fact that on the Step Functions team, we keep making it easier to, uh, or so you don't have to write as many Lambdas. Um, it actually, so I don't know if you saw our launch yesterday of new, of new intrinsic functions, uh, but uh, we actually are working on a number of other kind of game changing uh, things in conjunction with the Lambda team. And so, like, step functions, obviously, like, Lambda is our, uh, what almost everyone or most of our customers use for their, for their compute with their state machines. So, yeah, I'm just going to go with Lambda. Awesome. And, and as one of the world's premier middle of the bell curve programmers, maybe a little to the left of, the belt middle. Um, I, I, I've used a lot of AWS services and I, was, I actually founded a company on top of S3 when it launched way, way, way in a galaxy far, far ago. So I like the idea of S3, but the one that really got me excited today, because I hadn't really seen it in real life, I'd heard about it, was Step Functions. I think that is a transformational tool to really extend the kind of programming I love, which is like low code, no code. You know, if you're a middle of the bell curve guy like me, not having to write complex logic in programming languages, I love that. So I can see myself building lots of business logic in step functions down the road, of course, on top of the world's best database, MongoDB. <laughs> Great. So the next question I have is, we've heard a lot of different approaches to EDA design today, uh, books that people should read, places to get started, uh, places to advance their current applications. Um, many of our customers in the room uh, are developers and engineers very heavy in this space. But taking a step back, there are people in the room and people uh, watching at home who don't really know what EDA is or where to get started. Um, so this is kind of open to, to everyone to answer. Um, what's your kind of one golden tip you would have for people getting started? That could be a book recommendation, a project to build, uh, something to try out or keep in mind uh, if you're just getting started with EDA. Um, I can take that one. I think uh, we plugged it at the beginning, but it's just such a phenomenal collection of resources on serverless land. Um, I think they've got everything pulled into one place, which is amazing. Um, and also, I know that we ran it a couple times today, but if you didn't get a chance to check out Serval Espresso, I think that the workshop and the open source code of that is an amazing way to kind of take a look at what a real application looks like when it's event-driven um, and have that as kind of an a example that you can work towards. Um, I think it's really helpful to have that out there. Anyone else? I, I think the thing that I've started doing, as I said, a middle-of-the-road programmer. Um, first of all, I think you need to get to understand asynchronous programming. And I think starting with an asynchronous programming model in whatever your favorite programming language is, every, every, uh, all the programming languages I'm aware of have some kind of asynchronous model. That's a great starting point before you kind of jump off your process into the big wide world. Um, John Page's demo showed a load of really simple, basic services today, but I guarantee you there's a thousand of those tutorials out there. Download one of those tutorials and start changing it. It's with the change that you'll start to discover what's working and what's not working, what's going in. Also, understanding what a system looks like when nothing's happening. If you know that, then you can start to look at a system when things are actually going on. Yeah, definitely. And also, if you are a middle-of-the-road programmer like me and 
Um, then I, but also, if you're a very advanced one and you just want to make your life a lot easier, play around with Step Functions Workflow Studio. It's a really easy way to just play around and like it's fine if you mess up because you're just testing stuff out um, and you don't have to write loads of code. I mean, if you want to wrestle with Amazon States language, be my guest. Um, but the, the team have made it a lot easier not to not have to do that and just to get your concepts behind it. And I found that personally for me, I haven't been in tech very long. I changed careers uh, two and a half years ago uh, and now I'm sitting here talking to these guys about their services. So um, Step Functions was like really revolutionary revolutionary for me and I love the workflow studio and talk about it all the time so it's one AWS service and and feature of the service that I would say would be really useful for beginners to get their head around but now I'm going to take us on a different leap and I'm going to go to Mongo for this one and then if you guys want to jump in afterwards uh, any examples of when we shouldn't be using EDA so for me EDA is about looking at a sophisticated programming model with a sophisticated programming team. And I think for a lot of the use cases that we want to solve with software, you may not need as sophisticated a programming model as you're thinking about. And so I think the most important thing is for people to assess the challenges they face, the skills they have, the tools that are available to them and that they're able to use before diving in wholesale into the EDA environment. We've seen an incredible array of technology from AWS and partners today to help you get into this world. But EDA is for quite sophisticated workloads and use cases. Maybe your use case doesn't need all that firepower. Anyone else want to touch on that? Yeah, so I'll um, maybe I'll, I'll build on that a little bit and, and also kind of connect to what you said earlier just about thinking asynchronously. Um, you know, you know I, that, that once you get thinking asynchronously and then helping to sort of influence and, and advise, you know, your stakeholders to think that way as well, at the requirements level, you might see something where, you know, somebody's, uh, you know, a stakeholder's written a user story that says, you know, after the user hits the buy button, then we will show a order confirmed. And there's some ambiguity in saying order confirmed because that might imply that you have, before presenting that to the customer, you have actually taken the, the financial transaction, confirmed that it works, you've checked inventory, you've done all these different things that are, that are individual microservices. But to say order confirmed must mean that you have done all of those things and then said it. And, so, and there might be an actual need to, to do it in that way. But thinking asynchronously might say, well, instead of saying order confirmed, we have acknowledged your intent to buy a product. And now intent means now a bunch of systems are gonna go and do various things. And, and maybe at the end of that, an email comes out saying, sorry, it failed, or yes, it's confirmed. But that's sort of the difference between that, that asynchronous versus synchronous thinking. And, mm -hmm. Awesome. And then I guess building on that, uh, and where we see the kind of the future of EDA going, you guys run a lot of cool tools and services uh, to help customers on that journey. Um, but what's a gap or gaps do you see in the tooling for EDA at the moment? I'll take that one. Um, and I think this is where, where we have a, the biggest opportunity to disrupt as well. Um, one of the beautiful things about synchronous programming is that failure, and beautiful and I guess ugly things about when you operate those synchronous systems is that when they fail, the failures are very apparent. Um, everything is a cascading failure. Um, your customers are impacted immediately as well when those things happen. With the vendor-driven architectures, because of the loose coupling, there is a potential, a very strong potential, that things are failing and you don't notice, which is uh, you know, too much of a good thing. And I think in terms of tooling, observability, and then having improvements in observability, um, being able to detect, I, I, and I think you know, we talk, we, there was a talk earlier today about alarms and metrics and how to set those right thresholds. I think with the event-driven architectures, we can really talk about anomalies instead of alarms and, and metrics, where it's like, when is something anomalous that is happening, that is, wasn't happening before? It could be a certain type of event volume that you never saw before. It could be a consumer that is slow or a consumer that is down. That should normally was consuming events, but it's no longer consuming events. Being able to not just know something is wrong, but know what is wrong, and then ideally how to fix it. 
uh, I think is a really, really cool tool operationally for disruptions. Uh, and then we'd really be disrupting operations moving forward and making EDAs even more powerful as a, as a, as a concept, as an architecture. So I think that's one area of the tooling that we really need to work on. And we, we are already starting to you know, take, make some initiatives. You'll see some interesting things come out over the next few months in, in this regard. Well, this leads me very nicely onto my next question. Um, what areas do you guys expect to see in innovation in EDA that could be products, but also maybe approaches or things that you're kind of seeing start to emerge? I think one that I've been excited about um, and that made the, the launch yesterday that Dan mentioned of intrinsic functions within uh, step functions super exciting is I think just that little bit of kind of data manipulation within some of these services that do allow you to kind of choose configuration over code and, and write and test and maintain less code. Um, I think that one has been one that we've, we've gotten a request for a lot, and so that was a super exciting one to see go live. I also think we're not slowing down in the integration space itself. Uh, writing code that calls other code is not super fun. Uh, so uh, we, we talked about, in your talk, Rebecca, we talked about um, the step functions integrations with AWS APIs, and we cover about 10,000 API actions there. Um, I think event prison needs to do something similar there as well in that space. But more importantly, we need to just continue to help bridge the gap between any API system. So it doesn't have to be AWS or APIs. Um, today, EventBridge can call any public SaaS API, but we want to be able to call any API. Maybe it belongs to a different cloud provider. Maybe it, um, it's a private API that's running on your on-premise. On Whichever the API is, we want to be able to call, have step functions and EventBridge be able to call them. Because I think that is the new integration, modern integ application integration pattern that's coming up. And we're, and we're seeing so much excitement about Step Functions' ability to, to do so, or EventBridge's ability to call public APIs. Customers want to be able to continue that for other application types as well. So I, I, I really think that's another area of focus for us. Yeah, and, and building on that a little bit, one, one of the tenants we have in, in EventBridge is, is where, where two developers and two distinct organizations would write the same piece of code to do something. That's something we feel is an opportunity for us to, to remove that undifferentiated heavy lifting and just make it, make, you know, allow developers to focus on their unique functionality and their unique business logic. And so there's, there's you know, I, I think you can extrapolate it in a lot of different directions on that, but when you just think about data in motion on atomic events and, and some of the common things that you would need to do, like serializing, deserializing, JSON, type checking, validation, a lot of those kinds of things are, are things that we think a lot about. Okay, so my next question, I'm going to start with Dan. Uh, based on the recent announcement about intrinsic functions, we've mentioned it four times in counting, so read our blogs after this. Um, but a common question I get asked as NSA, um, we have a technical field community at AWS, so that's also other SAs asking us questions that their customers ask them, is when should you use a Lambda function and when should you use step functions and when should you use both of them together? Uh, and given that intrinsic functions are now doing some stuff that Lambda was doing before, do you have an answer for customers on when they should pick one or the other or use them together? Uh, and I guess others, if you jump in from, from your experience too after that. Yeah, so, so yeah, thanks for the question. So I, th I think we're, you, um, there's a few trade-offs where you want to consider like using step functions um, and, or, or Lambda or both of them together. Uh, one of them is, uh, one, one, uh, one thing to avoid is actually creating like monolithic Lambdas. Like it's possible to, um, it's possible to end up put, trying to pack too much into a Lambda function and the reality is that that would be better served uh, by a, breaking up that Lambda function into multiple functions and then using a step function uh, state machine to, to orchestrate that and uh, handle all of the errors around that. There's, uh, there's kind of like, um, if, if you, it makes sense to put your business logic into, into Lambda, but there's a lot of like un, undifferentiated heavy lifting where step functions can help out, like related to the error handling. And and uh, and things like that, or just kind of if you just need to call AWS APIs. I mean, we can call virtually any any AWS API, so and uh, and get the response and handle it within the workflow. So it, so in many cases, um, like using something like an Express workflow uh, can be um, can be a really effective way to to do what you may, may have used a Lambda for for previously. But some, things like like data processing or, or things like that. Like this is this is an area where where like a lot of customers use step functions and Lambda together, um, where step functions handles the orchestration, maybe uses the map state, fans out, and, and handles a lot of data processing. This is something actually we're working to 
to to improve uh, in terms of like the concurrencies we support and and, and things like that and and uh, but like that's another reason to use step functions and lambda together is to really build like multi step multi step processes where you're doing work in parallel and uh, you're handling errors and uh, and you're kind of making decisions and another big one is like human human in the loop so if you want to, if you want to involve a human if you want to wait like waiting is free for step functions um, and so if you have a reason to wait or if you want to bring a human into the loop and wait for their response step functions is a, is a fantastic uh, thing to or solution to combine with lambda yeah, I think that's been one that's been really powerful for a lot of, of my customers in the public sector space. There are always going to be instances in, you know, any kind of citizen service where there probably is a human involved at some point for some reason. Uh, and that's where step functions have been really powerful for them. So now I'm going to take some audience questions. And I've got a really interesting one as an essay myself. And I said that I was the voice of the field to them. So maybe this answers it a little bit. Um, but how do you manage your product roadmaps? And what feedback do you use to influence them? So at AWS, we say that 90% of our features are direct customer feedback and 10% is our inference and what we think that customers want based on that other feedback. Um, but how do you as a product team, when I say my customers want this, 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 how does it actually get onto the roadmap and then uh, later down the line become a feature like intrinsic functions? So, so I can say that one of the, uh, I mean the top three features that uh, have come in as product feature requests. So uh, if you can actually work with your uh, TAM uh, or account managers to get feature requests filed, and uh, those always come back to the product team. We always look at them and we take them really seriously. And so, like, basically, we are currently working on the top three feature requests that have come in from customers. Um, and and so, like, yeah, that, that customer customer feedback is really important. And then conferences conferences like this, we're active on Twitter, lots of different like feedback channels where we um, where we kind of look at one, one thing I've actually noticed uh, just as an anecdote is is like developer delight. Type type features don't really come in through like the formal kind of product product um, like feedback or PFR like channel uh, because uh, like basically they're not they make a lot of difference to you as a developer but they aren't necessarily blocking you from kind of adopting a specific service so that's so so as a uh, product manager that's where I kind of look to a lot of engagement on on like twitter conferences like this conversations to be able to pull in a lot of the de developer delight and developer experience type requests in order to make the product better yeah, that's super interesting. And I think I would echo that also, that if anyone was in my workshop this morning, they would have seen Dan going around the room, asking people if he could take pictures of their screens, writing down notes over things where people said, oh, it would be really cool if uh, Workflow Studio did this. So they really, really do care. Um, like They're all jet lagged here answering your questions because they really, really care about customer feedback. So let them have a drink, but also tell them if you want stuff updated. Um, so a cool question that's come from the crowd, and I'd be interested to hear any of your responses to this. Is serverless dead, and is it now all EDA? So I think that the way that I typically frame this is I think of serverless as very much kind of the operating model of all of these services. So it's very much kind of the like the best practice and the ideal of how much can you how much code can you not write? How much of that kind of undifferentiated code that another developer also needs to write? Um, can you offload to AWS and just focus on the business logic? And I think that's wrapped up in serverless. Whereas event-driven architectures and kind of the whole EDA concept that, that we're talking about today is much more about kind of what are you building on top of that and how are you architecting in a way that's going to allow you to have really nicely decoupled uh, applications in which teams can move really quickly and uh, be able to deploy and, and build very independently. Um, and so I think that they're very much interrelated concepts. And I think when I talk to customers, um, I kind of put forward serverless event-driven architectures as the best way to build applications. Um, but definitely distinct ideas. Anyone else want to chime in? I, I always laugh when people say X is dead. Nothing dies in technology. Go to any banking data center and you will see a list of technology and hardware that stretches out way back into the 1950s and beyond. So saying serverless is dead. We're at the very forefront of modern development practices with EDA. So we're like the 0.01% of developers doing this. I mean, Amazon 
historically has been at the very forefront of developer innovation in terms of tooling and accessibility and the whole nine yards of capability. Um, so we should be aware that behind us is that big bell curve of people who are still building monoliths and think that's a pretty cool way to build software. So yeah, serverless is going to be around for a long time. And I like the idea of it being an operating model for all the stuff that we're starting to do with EDA. Yeah, definitely. And I, to that point, okay, maybe not from the 50s, but my first ever corporate job, uh, we had to send some docs to America and they only accepted it by fax. And me, as a 21-year-old in that job, not that long ago, because I'm still in my 20s, was like, where am I going to find a fax machine in this office? So I found the most tenured person in the business and said, if we had a fax machine, where would it be? And she said, ah, once upon a time, we had one in this room. Let's go have a look. It wasn't in that room, but then we found the person who'd moved stuff from that room and found one fax machine and we plugged it in and prayed. So people still do need old tech. Um, interesting one, though, we talked about, I guess, the bell curve. And so one of the questions we've been asked is, do you have any advice or tips for developing an event-driven culture in a traditional uh, tech organization? Yeah, and I think this, I mean, if you've heard about Amazon's culture and how we organize ourselves, we are really organized for speed. We really care about speed. And, and I think... The, the biggest selling point, if you're trying to take this, this idea, these ideas back to your organization, is around, hey, we'll be able to deliver features, um, simplify our operations um, so much more easily. And it's, I think this is true for pretty much any organizations. There's lots of developers here as well. We are prized resources right now, like, and for the humanity itself. There's so few developers out there. There's so many things to build, so little time. Anything that saves us time or makes, makes developers as force multipliers, any business worth their salt are going to jump on that. So I think going back to the cultural aspect of it, the way EDA speed you up is they limit communication and organization and coordination between teams and between humans. Um, in fact, when you kind of look at the sort of the post-COVID world, I'm sure many of you are now working more from home or completely remotely. Even then, like if you have, if you have architectures or actual technology, even within the team, is more asynchronous or designed for more asynchronous work, you're gonna be better within a team, forget between teams as well. So I think in some ways it's actually a tailwind for organizations to think more asynchronously or more event-driven. So I think these are some of the concepts you wanna take back with you to your team if you're, if you're thinking of developing the culture there. Anyone else? Take everybody's laptop, strip off all the IDEs, all the compilers, all the interpreters, and tell them they can only write Lambda functions. That'll get them for serverless and, and uh, AEDP pretty quickly. <laughs> I like that one. Um, and I guess uh, uh, there's a kind of a few different uh, questions we've got coming in now that are a little bit more uh, focused. So uh, one for the EventBridge team. Um, is, is there still... A, a 0 0.5 second delay when putting events on a event bridge. Is, are there plans to reduce this? <laughs> I, that sounds like a plant to me, maybe. But uh, um, yeah, so latency is something we have been thinking a lot about um, since we, uh, you know, if, if, if you were with EventBridge maybe before it was EventBridge, it was CloudWatch Events, um, and, and sort of the architecture and scaling and the, and the runway we've been putting into it for the last several years. Um, latency has been a, bit, a big part of that, and we are very close to making something very special, I think, on the uh, latency reduction side. Very, very close. <laughs> um, I love that. Um, and I feel like Eric wrote this one in himself. Um, Eric got me all excited about Sam, but everyone else in my company is using CDK. What's your preference and why? Actually, I'll be the controversial one. I love CDK. Uh, just because I, th I think writing, uh, like just being able to understand and not having to learn another uh, for format in YAML or with SAM, I could, I could figure out like whichever my favorite TypeScript or Java, whatever you want to write your uh, CDK code in. Uh, I think it's incredibly powerful. I also know lots of lots and lots and lots of customers, especially at the mid mid level, custom mid size customers, find Sam to be the perfect fit for them, uh, where they can just move super fast with it. Um, but my personal favorite is CDK still. Yeah, 
there's a huge CDK community in the serverless space as well. But also, I think as a as an SA, it really depends on ex exactly that, like the capacity in your team and like how much learning you have to do. What are you actually building? I find Sam super useful for like net new serverless applications. But if I'm kind of updating things that are already in a programming language that I understand, and you know maybe my team doesn't have loads of time uh, to train up, then CDK is a really great option. Um, the next one, uh, for people getting started with serverless and EDA, the capaci capacity to scale uh, seems almost indefinite as a superpower, but there's also potential for huge costs. Is there any way to actively limit costs by default and not just send alerts? <laughs> I'll take this one too then. <laughs> um, so it's, it's, it is a double-edged sword. Like for, for example, I talked to customers who are like, why does EventBridge have uh, a 10,000 TPS limit by default? Um, it's not because EventBridge can't take more than 10,000 TPS. It handles tens of millions of TPS uh, any, at any given time. It is part, it's mostly because we want customers to not hurt themselves um, in this, this regard. But there's more work to be done here. Um, specifically, one way with serverless customers can, and I think Gregor was talking about it in his, in his keynote at the beginning, is a loop. You can create a, easily create a loop which is now calling the, your compute over and over and over again. Um, we're doing, we've already done a bunch of work this year to uh, detect loops uh, proactively and disable them, uh, even before customers notice. Um, obviously, there's non-trivial loops which are trickier to, to identify, but there's more work that we're doing. To, uh, to, to work through that. Um, similarly, Lambda, uh, one way, for example, if you're really getting started and you're concerned about costs is looking at Lambda concurrency itself. So if you can set a, you can lower your concurrency from the default, um, and then that just basically will prevent you from, from uh, spiraling out of control when you're not confident about, uh, about, your, about your application or you're not conf confident in whether you might have an issue or a defect that could cause that. Um, and then finally, I know it said without alerts, but the AWS has a whole bunch of budget, budget and uh, budget control tools. Um, those work really, really quickly if they're seeing that any anomaly, anomalous behavior in your spend in your account, have those configured. Like that's a really, really good way of catching it. I think the other part that I also always say to customers is make sure that your security controls in IAM are set so that your developers can only access the resources that they're meant to access. Because uh, often we see uh, cost implications because developers have, I don't know, continuously ping in a database that actually they don't need to be doing. Um, and so even though it's from a security perspective, it's also from a cost controls perspective to make sure that your developers can't just spin up any number of containers uh, from a certain step function or whatever it is. Because uh, it's not one service in and of itself that usually put, puts the costs up. It's, it's multiple together. Um, just conscious of time, I've got time for one more uh, kind of customer question before I close out. Um, so something uh, that, that they, the crowd has said they don't think they've seen uh, too much of in discussions today is around best practices for testing. So what resources would you recommend to help upskill uh, our testing in the EDA space? I do think that, uh, and to echo my earlier point, I would point people towards serverless land because I think we have some great blogs um, that get into kind of some of the, the details of uh, depending on kind of what testing strategy you're looking for. Because um, I do think that it is uh, a mindset shift for folks if they're new to serverless or new to asynchronous programming. Um, and so I think that just to acknowledge the fact that it will look different um, and that it might be a little bit of kind of a learning curve, uh, but there are some great resources out there, um, and that would be the first place that I would look for, for some more in-depth uh, content around that. Well, I, I was just going to say for step functions, um, so this, has, this is something that we have worked to improve like earlier this year, and we are continuing to work to improve, uh, but we did launch a... Uh, uh, for, for unit testing state machines, we did launch a local runner or a new capability in our local runner last year for unit testing where you can like mock calls to other services and then you can test all of your control logic and error handling logic uh, for, for your state machines there. And then we typ typically guide people to like do the integration testing where they're calling the other services in the cloud in the real environment. And that's the kind of best, best way to do that to ensure that uh, kind of what you, what you see is what you get um, type, type experience. 
Canaries, canaries are awesome. I mean, it's event driven, so it's very easy to generate load and put it through your entire system exactly the way your customer would as well. You know, use them everywhere. Yeah, I mean, the, the testing and debugging environments for traditional development are phenomenal. Um, we're really in the infancy of this particular approach. It's incumbent on you as a developer, and it's one of the most challenging things of EDA is putting in your tracking, debugging, testing infrastructure at the same time as you build your system. It's really hard to retrofit it when something is going wrong. You gotta start with that. It's the same way. I always start a program and I go, I don't need any tests for this program because it's only a small program. And then it goes wrong and I'm like, I wish I had tests. And now it's only taken me like 30 years or so to realize I actually have to write those tests at the same time as I write the program. But it's doubly so for EDA because you are going to come unstuck because it'll all work till it stops working. And then you're like, where did it go wrong? I don't really know. Also, they all said it's in the infancy. They've added stuff this year, but they're adding more. So if you want to see stuff, tell them as you start building up. It would be really great if there was this testing feature. Tell them, you never know. If you don't tell them, it won't go on. Um, you want a testing then, feature. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then I guess to close out on that same point, um, for, um, for all of you to answer, are there any hot of the press launches, uh, things on the roadmap that we should be aware of and listening out for, uh, events we should be attending uh, or from your, your organizations or services? Well, we talked about latency, and that is, like I said, very, very close. Um, so you'll see some improvements there. Um, I think maybe I'll pause there and pass it on. No, I think we can go a little bit further. Um, so here's here's the thing: as a as an uh, as a as the owner of these applications, I'm incredibly excited. I think the next 12 weeks we have a whole bunch of launches, all the way going into reinvent. So, firstly, keep your keep your eyes. Uh, uh, open for those and ears peeled for that. I think there's going to be there's a whole bunch. So beyond latency, um, uh, there are definitely more improvements to step functions coming around limits and being able to scale out and and do do uh, making David the large scale data processing simpler with step functions in Lambda. Um, and I know Jamie was being polite, but even with the vent bridge, there's a whole bunch of quality of life features coming around more capabilities and filtering, uh, being able to filter on newer different types of things. Um, and, and even bringing some of those capabilities and some of those integrations to other uh, messaging and eventing platforms and uh, uh, like uh, SQS, SNS, and, and Kafka, and Kinesis. But stay tuned. So I, I, I really, we, uh, we've done a ton of stuff in MongoDB in the last sort of several years. The two features I've talked about today on the stand that seem to have people's eyes light up. One is data federation, which effectively allows you to configure any collection so that as the collection ages out, we archive it into S3. You can still query it, but it's slower, but it means your overall costs of hosting drop down as you move the storage into S3 storage. Uh, the second thing that people really liked when we talked about it was we have a built-in Lucene indexing engine. So you get full text indexing for free in your Atlas clusters. So if you want to reduce the cost of your overall hosting by removing an elastic cluster from your deployment, you can run MongoDB and get that full, full text indexing. We have triggers and event bridge integrations and all of the stuff that makes this a very nice database to work with. If you know, you're looking for something else other than DynamoDB, and most of you seem to really love DynamoDB. <laughs> Um, and then the final thing I'll say is, we mentioned it a bit earlier about features, but if you have really, really enjoyed today, uh, go to London, do loads of really great uh, tech events. And we've got a pretty big one coming up in November called reInvent. It's in Vegas. A lot of us will be there. And there's even more content in this space. So if you've liked today and you want to go to Vegas, beg your boss to let you go. Um, but I'll see you all downstairs soon. Thank you to all the panelists for sharing, uh, and we'll see you all later. All right. <laughs>